The value of pro bono is that you can take on cases that you would not normally encounter. And what pro bono work has done is really broadened my horizons. And I pretty much am open to learning about any area of the law when a pro bono opportunity presents itself. Karen, as an Asian American, works in the community to give voice to the voiceless. And in the first part of 2020, she was instrumental in helping Avi come up with a response to the anti-Asian violence. One of the things that she did was to help us put together a report on the anti-Asian violence in 2020. And that report was called A Rising Tide of Hate, and that led to the formation of the Anti-Asian Violence Task Force. Through the task force, we formalized the HEART program the Hate Eradication Active Response Team, and she also led the way in writing a second report called Endless Tide. Unfortunately, the numbers kept rising and the situation was not improving even as the pandemic was declining. And so that second report was also extremely important to the cause and to understanding the problem. Karen's pro bono work has been extraordinarily valuable to this firm. I mean, she's just been remarkable in her ability to find the kinds of cases that make our lawyers really want to come to work every day and want to do some good. Karen's pro bono work really sets a great example for younger associates. It both encourages them to do the pro bono work themselves, but it also shows them that you can work at a large firm and have a balance between paying clients and pro bono work. I think pro bono work is super important and super valuable for young lawyers who are starting out in their careers. So what I encourage all of my associates to do is really find a case that speaks to you that provides an experience that you wouldn't necessarily get to see through your day-to-day -day work. I think Karen sets a great example that way to junior associates. And she also you know, goes out of her way to make sure that it's worthwhile and they really get a lot of benefit from doing this type of work. On the Golan trial, you know, we had numerous junior associates who put witnesses on at trial. Karen took a very complicated federal case for us. It's a case that falls under the Hague Convention for International Child Abduction. The case went up to the Second Circuit and back down a number of times, and the entire time, Karen stuck with the case. And then, of course, ultimately, Karen brilliantly and strategically argued the case at the U.S. Supreme Court, and I don't think we could have asked for a better person up there arguing on behalf of domestic violence victims. I mean, she spent countless hours working with the client, commiserating with the client when things didn't go well. I mean, she lived and breathed the case for years. The strategic brilliance that she brought, her incredible dedication, not just to the client, Ms. Golan, but also to helping many domestic violence survivors by making good case law is really huge. I mean, she's one of the best pro bono partners that Sanctuary's ever worked with, and I was personally thrilled to work with her throughout this case. She exemplifies what I think all lawyers should do, which is to, as busy as they are, make time to give back to the community and to do pro bono work. I think the reason Karen does so much pro bono work is, I mean, this sounds a little bit cliche, but she has a really good heart and she really wants to help people. It's an extraordinary part of her and I just am very proud that she has that spirit. It allows you to understand the world around you a little bit better. You'll get exposed to people, clients, issues, industries that you would not normally encounter. But what's really rewarding is that you get to meet members of the community and help them solve their problems. My name is Charles B. Phillips. I'm an emeritus attorney with Blue Ridge Legal Services. When Charlie approached us, he said he'd been a family lawyer, among other things, for 50 years in his private practice, and now that he was retiring, he wanted to volunteer with us, and we had no idea the gift that Charlie was giving us. I was 80 years old when I retired. I did not want to quit. I loved the law, and I thought maybe my services could help some people who couldn't afford an attorney. I was in an abusive marriage, and I knew I had to get legal help, and I knew I couldn't afford an attorney, so I thought legal aid. And at the time, I knew nothing about legal aid. I sort of thought it was all people who were just out of law school, you know, and 
just learning the ropes. And instead I get this kind of the salty southern version of Professor Kingsfield, you know, it was like, wow, I have a real lawyer. And I had been so afraid and so lost. And all of a sudden it was like someone was going to stand up for me. It was amazing. He was very compassionate and extremely understanding. To volunteer and to do the kind of work that he has done when everybody else at his stage in life would just be putting their feet up, I think that's just amazing. He had done a full legal career and done it well. Charlie is absolutely a lawyer from the top of his head to the tip of his toes. As my partners told me in January of 1990, if you want to know how things are done, you go to Charlie. And then on retirement, he volunteers to come to our office, taking some of the hardest cases and doing it for free, doing it because these clients need it. When I see someone who is about to get steamrolled in court and really needs help, I don't need any outside influence. I take it on my own, ask them to come in for an appointment, and we get started on their case. He's helped over 1,500 clients in the five years or so that he's been volunteering with us, and our clients sing his praises. Mr. Phillips turned everything around. He changed the ending of the story for me and gave me a chance. You were available, professional, honest, kind, and steadfast. I admire your work ethic and excellent representation. Thank you for your guidance and for donating your many years of experience to my family. Just because our clients can't pay for his services doesn't mean that he's not giving them his very best and Charlie's doing it every day. I'm appreciative to the ABA for acknowledging this kind of expertise and experience and it is not an overstatement to say that he is truly a local and a legal legend in this area. I've been practicing now 60 years thanks to becoming an emeritus attorney and I hope God gives me the intellect and health to keep me going so I can do this as long as I can. Service to others was one of the core principles on which Davis Wright Tremaine was founded and remains an intrinsic part of our culture here today. From the minute I set foot in this firm, pro bono was preached as an important value. The common thread here is that we are all deeply devoted to doing good for communities that need help the most. All the resources of the law firm are available to pro bono projects as they are to any project. So anything that our private clients get, our pro bono clients get. One thing that Davis Wright has done in a very extraordinary and novel way is integrating our in-house legal department partners into that work. We're the first firm to have a in-house pro bono engagement manager in Caitlin Fallon. We focus on mobilizing as many people as we can to help our legal service partners and help in the communities where we have market presence, but also where our clients have market presence or wherever there's a legal desert, wherever we can have an impact. She's the first in the nation to fully focus on those kinds of corporate partnerships. And we were able to do that because we had such a strong interest from in-house legal departments that wanted to do good, but in-house legal departments aren't as resourced in this space as law firms traditionally are. And so what if we could reimagine the way in-house legal departments access pro bono? What does that look like? And the answer to that was the in-house Gateway to Good platform. So the Gateway to Good is a system that we built that connects in-house counsels with the pro bono opportunities that they're most passionate about. We want to be a resource for everyone to get involved in things that matter the most to them. We're connecting them with the resources that we use to run our pro bono program so that they too can build a pro bono program of their own. It's really driven by how can we scale? How can we get more people to help more people who need it. What we value as the Microsoft Pro Bono Program and our relationship with Davis Wright Tremaine 
is their willingness to serve constituencies that might not otherwise get access to legal services. An example of this is the Protecting Journalists Pro Bono initiative to support freelance and independent journalists. The scope of the program is really focused on providing journalists with access to pre-publication support. So before they publish an article, getting a team of attorneys to review it to ensure there aren't any legal issues in the article, and then also helping journalists get access to public records so that they can shed light on the issue that they're focused on. It is something that we are so well suited to do. We have a huge media practice. All of those lawyers became media lawyers for the purpose of protecting the First Amendment, and they're so eager to help communities and causes learn the news, hear the news, have access to the news, and to protect the journalists that are reporting it. Davis Wright is such a strong model for other pro bono programs. They set the bar really high for all of us to strive for, and they're constantly developing and innovating their own program and providing support to others in the pro bono space to help us take our programs to the next level. Not only does it benefit these communities and causes, but it directly benefits the attorneys that are participating in this really incredible work. There's a few matters or cases that will stand out in your career over time, and often the pro bono matters will be those matters, the matters with real heart, where your creativity and persistence and hard work will really pay off. Not everybody has the ability to do what we can do. It is a superpower if you treat it that way. Whether it's one hour or if it's 100 hours a year, every little bit counts, and I hope that people realize that. I grew up with a lot of people saying I like to argue. I had a fourth grade teacher who told me I should go to law school. At the time, I thought that was a compliment. Looking back, it was probably because I argued with her about everything. So it seemed like that was my strength and my skill set. And I found by going to law school, I've had the opportunity to help folks in a lot of different ways. Part of that, of course, is the pro bono practice. It's an opportunity to help folks who can't really help themselves. David Cross's pro bono work has given young associates the opportunity to represent individuals in life-changing matters. When you're working on the cases with him, he's very supportive, but he's also very exacting, and he has very high standards because he knows it's important. And to date, it's been the most meaningful work that I've done. And David's is such a great example because he just does the work. David has really distinguished himself in the realm of impact litigation, particularly through the Georgia case on voting rights. It was a lawsuit against the direct recording equipment. As an activist, I had been fighting against the use of these machines since 2005 because it takes your vote and turns it into a barcode. And so even though the human readable portion of your ballot is there, that is not the portion that's being counted. The part that's being counted is the barcode, which is machine language, which nobody can read. It became clear to me relatively shortly after David's involvement that we were going to be very, very well represented in that case, David himself has contributed more than 4,000 hours of his time pro bono. I think David and his team have recognized that what they are pursuing matters. What this case is about is saying, don't dictate trust, earn trust. That's what David and his team have worked so hard to try to make happen. In 2019, we got an injunction that shut down the old antiquated voting system in Georgia that was paperless and that we were able to show was just hopelessly vulnerable to manipulation. Now we are looking to improve on that and make sure the 2024 election is protected by having trustworthy paper trail. This case has motivated him to really go way above and beyond, and he leads by his dedication to seeing this very complex matter through, no matter how many years and how many hours it takes. I think he's deserving of this award because our vote is our everything, our vote is our voice. But David leads us all, 
and I feel like he's gonna lead us to victory. And so as I look back and think about all the different ways that I've been able to help people through the Promoto practice, it makes me feel like I've taken a legal career and done some good with it beyond just helping our billable clients. The time and effort that I've been able to put into that and to work with just really amazing lawyers and amazing people, it's been one of the best parts of the job. Prior to Memorial Day 2015, my law practice was primarily criminal defense, but when the Social Security Administration decided to target what is now almost 4,000 former clients of Eric Kahn, that completely changed my practice. For years, Eric Kahn was a more recognizable figure in Appalachia than the president. He bought every billboard, every TV station, and in 2015, 900 of his former clients all received suspension of benefits letter in that they learned that Khan was likely bribing the Social Security judge. At that point, the world changed. For most of these clients, their disability payments were their primary and often only source of income, so it was devastating to these people. And then helping people get their benefits back to me, that's an example of true concern for your fellow man. Nat is fearless and won't quit when he sees a wrong that needs to be remedied. Well, I had never done a social security case in my life. And at that point, the local legal aid, Apple Red Legal Aid, called me up and said, there's 80 people who need lawyers and there's a hearing today. So I showed up to represent Amy Hicks and the hearings basically infuriated me. The hearing started out with the judge saying, Miss Hicks, there's a secret finding of fraud that you can't challenge because Eric Kahn was your lawyer, guilt by association. And any evidence Kahn submitted is automatically excluded. We litigated the Amy Hicks case. It went all the way up to the Sixth Circuit. And then finally, after we basically won in four different appellate courts, the Hicks decision is now the law of the land and the Hicks decision has changed the landscape of administrative law. Ned has always been fueled by injustice. I think the SSA are bullies. I'm not gonna let these bullies win. I'm gonna fight for these people. And thank God I've had a lot of help from lawyers and law students from all over the nation. Ned put out a national call to other attorneys and law students to help because this was such a monumental task. And the best part of this awful debacle is this has been the greatest volunteer effort in the history of this nation. And that's what's kept me going. This has been going on for eight years. And if anything, he's doing more now than he did before. Because he's not through yet. He don't know the word quit. But he knows the word help. And he says, I won't quit as long as I think. I can't go. Ned, congratulations on receiving the Pro Bono Publico Award. This is a well-deserved honor to you, my friend, and I hope you take great pride in it. You truly exemplify what it means to serve your people. You know, I appreciate the ABA giving me this award, but it's odd generally you get an award after the situation you were in is resolved. We're not resolved. Eight years later, I don't know if we're at the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning. This is still going on, and I'm praying and hoping that one, the SSA will back down, and failing that, that we get enough volunteer lawyers and law students to come in and help my neighbors. We may be looking at another 2,200 hearings, and that's where lawyers and law students can make a real difference.